Okay. So let's uh, let's do that. Hello, hey. Richard <laughs> Unger, the man, the myth. This is uh, he is the founder of the International Institute of Hand Analysis. Is always treasured time if you can get even a minute of his attention given just that one, the world just one moment one moment <laughs> what myth tell me one of the myths <clears throat> the myth, Is the myth that... that i could still hit the outside shot from 30 feet <laughs> yeah at least he's playing basketball with those legs <laughs> that's a myth <laughs> that is a myth do you know, you might not know this uh, brent i did play basketball twice a week other than in my trips to uh, Zurich, but I played basketball, although I did play a little basketball in Zurich. I found a basketball game near the lake, but um, I did play basketball twice a week until I was 58. How old are you now? Uh, I am 50, um, <clears throat> 51, could be 51. Yeah. So I've, think, I've about, think about, about that a little. At your gentle age, I was still playing basketball twice a week and running you know running 10k three times a week i was still you know i was in my athletic phase straight into my 60s but that was then <laughs> now it's just in my memory banks <laughs> well you know if you imagine you're doing the three you know the half court shot right and apparently mm -hmm. that is that's exercising the same number of neurons because people actually grow muscle when they were imagining right and they're going through it's the true. practice it's so. true Although I don't think it would uh, work, uh, th uh, an interesting philosophical point. One thing I like to do with you is uh, talk philosophical points. So let's say that you have no basketball skill whatsoever. You've mm -hmm. never played basketball, you know, similar to me trying to kick a soccer ball with my left foot. Have you ever tried doing that? I'm a righty. Yeah, it's, it's as awkward as my right foot. Yeah, yeah. So if you're a good basketball player and you visualize uh, shooting the basket and it going through and you have good form. Apparently that has approximately the same value as practicing up to a point. Yeah. But if you, they've done research on that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But I could visualize all I want. I'm not kicking a soccer ball with my left foot effectively. Yeah. You're too skeptical then. Maybe you need to like, <laughs> imagine yourself really like killing it, like David Beckham with that left, left foot. But, you know, I have the same thing. I was doing an exercise of doing uh, pull-ups and I tried mm -hmm. to imagine myself doing 10 pull-ups, uh, one of these outside, uh -huh. and I could really feel the resistance in my body uh -huh. going, you can't do this. I was just imagining. Why couldn't I just imagine myself doing 10? Well, just one second, just one second. So the, the shaman, and I use shaman in the most uh, respectful terminology possible. Mm. Uh, the wise man, the wise woman, the one in the uh, community that people look to uh, when they have physical and or psychological or spiritual issues, they're looking to for guidance and help, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So does the wise shaman jump off the Empire State Building to prove a mind over matter and the shaman can land softly. Is that what the, no, the shaman says, thank you very much. I'm not stupid. I'm a shaman. I'm not stupid. I don't jump off the empire state building. I mean, you have to be an idiot. My, my point being that there are laws of physics and that the shaman works within the laws of physics. I will say, however, that the laws of physics have a wider range than most people give that credit to, but, <laughs> but not an infinite range, not an infinite range. You know, I have, I've had uh, over a thousand students, I've counted, I've had over a thousand students in my years of being a hand reading teacher. Congrats. And I've, and I have faced this issue numerous times with students who say, I don't have to read hands to get good at it. I just have to imagine being good at it. I don't have to do anything to promote my business. All I have to do is think good thoughts and my phone will ring. Here, let me tell you what happened on Thursday. And I say, thank you very much. I put on my smiley face and I go inside my own head. You've got to be kidding. You're a child. That's Tinkerbell thinking. You know, if I clap my hand, you know, Peter Pan. So on the other hand, there is a whole bunch to positive thinking. There's a whole bunch to widening the scope of what you believe is possible, uh, et cetera, et cetera. If you think you're a failure, you're probably gonna fail at tiddlywinks, et cetera. But you and me thinking 
that we could win the World Cup with a team that we put together next week, Brent, that's fanciful. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I guess we, um, I can't even get my head around that. But then, you know, <clears throat> my experience is that as I am visualizing as a morning ritual my day, and I set up the program of that day that, uh, and I created as a Walt Disney day that has uh, me as the protagonist. And I'm, I'm making sure that every obstacle is one and I'm broken through. That has a great difference to my day in the Agreed. Spring, because I have an internal resistance often as I face these obstacles that don't uh, uh, somehow are overcome with a proper amount of sleep for the first 10 to 20 minutes of the day. I, I completely agree. Uh, I'm not against the uh, concept at all. Have you read Think and Grow Rich? I did. I, you know, that's the foundation of pretty much every self-help book and Tony Robbins and everything. And I did, but I, I don't give it the credit that I think and life changing that everyone does. But okay. I like the thinking, right? In 1975, I moved to Houston, Texas. I was following some pretty girl who we stayed together a few more months. And then, you know, that was then. But now I was in Houston, Texas. <laughs> And uh, so I did financial planning for six years living in Houston, uh, Texas. That's the job I quit to do this full time. And my first boss, who became my best pal, my basketball buddy, uh, et cetera, et cetera, gave me two books to read as part of my preparation for being a, a success as a financial planner. Mm -hmm. Think and Grow Rich was one of the two. And the other was an Ogmandino book, The Greatest Salesman in the World. Uh, have you ever heard of Og Mandino? You're of a different generation. So he was a famous motivational speaker in an era before your time. And uh, that book is a short book. You could read it in one day. I very much recommend it. The greatest salesman in the world. Mm -hmm. And it has to do with communication skills. How mm -hmm. important is communication skills in hand reading? Well, what I've learned to be a good hand reader is that you have to at least, at least to make it, you better learn how to sell. And to get and get into people's problem, which means you have a new definition of selling, don't sell. <laughs> you have to get into people's problems and solve them and make sure that they understand that you're the person who has that problem and that they have a, a impact in their life if they change it. Right. And how important is listening skills? I have learned the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> yes. In marriage, in sales, in palmistry, in everything. So listening skills. Anyway, that book, uh, uh, well, one of its focus is listening skills. I'm back to um, the, um, uh, the uh, Think and Grow Rich book, which was written now 90 years ago. Uh, so that's a long time ago. And anybody who reads it, um, I, I recommend you forgive the fellow for being born uh, so many generations ahead of you. Uh, so he talks a certain way and underneath his language are some of the suppositions from you know the early 20th century that we would find maybe quaint i'll put that word in quotes but nonetheless i made an outline of that book i only had a purple pen with me that day as i started taking notes so my notes were in purple pen i had a five page notated uh, uh my notes from think and grow rich which i referred to every morning and most nights, but not quite every night. Because what he said was for you to write down basically an affirmation about what you want and what you're willing, what you want God to give to you in exchange for all your energy of working on your I want. He really emphasized the um, emotively invested I want. You have to put emotion behind your I want on a consistent basis. So he said, read that to yourself every morning and every night. And I did half or maybe three quarters of that. And he also said in that sentence, what you want God to give to you and what you're willing to give back to God. And he wanted you to write that down and read it to yourself twice a day. Twice. And he said, Twice yes, morning and night. First thing in the morning, last thing at night. Again, I did the morning, you know, and I had a 50% ratio, let's say, at night. And I did that for years. And 
when he said the universe had no choice but to bend itself to the power of what he called your thinking. You know, it's, it's about uh, how your thoughts can alter the fabric of the universe. But he, one of the things that I took away from that was the, um, uh, the I want that was driving me was not the same I want that's driving me today because my I wants were about business back then and you know being able to support my family etc like that but it was the emotional investment the consistent emotional investment behind the I want so on New Year's Day people write down their New Year's resolutions I'm going to lose 10 pounds I'm going to save a thousand dollars you know I'm going to clean the garage you know the the standard list of New Year's resolutions whatever they may be but by June uh, 22nd, which is the day we're meeting right now, isn't it? Yes. Day after the longest day of the year. Mm. Right. So uh, by, by June 22nd, how many people are really acting on their New Year's resolutions? Or remember. Percentage. Yeah. But not the majority. Yeah. Because there was no consistent emotional energy. There was no consistent force. And he's talking about an emotional force mm -hmm. behind those I wants. And to me, this corresponded to the metaphysical classes I was taking at the same time, which uh, discussed the earth plane as an emotional training ground. That uh, my teacher at the time, William David, uh, discussed things like this is one uh, system, the earth plane, is one system in a much larger system of other planets and other suns. And this is the heart chakra of that larger system where the Pleiades represent the crown chakra, blah, 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 blah. He had this whole crazy notion type thing, which, you know, I listened, it was interesting, but it didn't really matter. His emphasis was on the importance of emotion. Mm -hmm. You and I are mental types, aren't we? Highly. We think, we enjoy looking at systems, learning systems, applying systems, comparing, contrasting, putting this piece of that system together with this piece of this system to un uncode something that we can then refashion to be usable for people. You know, we're analytic types in that use of the word. So uh, it's not like I ignored feeling, but it was interesting that a class that didn't say anything about the heart chakra or feelings focused on the importance of emotionality, being able to register feelings to be and to be able in effect to direct your emotional self in certain ways to be honestly uh, recognizing, but also to be able to deploy and to aim your emotionality. Think and Grow Rich is about aimed emotionality. Mm. It's not about growing rich. Mm -hmm. It's about mm -hmm. aiming your emotionality. And one of the key points he made mm -hmm. was, first of all, it had to have power because something, you know, I want to clean the garage that doesn't have power. So it has to be something that you really want. It has to be filled with emotional energy. And he said, and that's useless if it's done once or twice in a row. It mm -hmm. has to be done with consistency. The universe is so arranged that your I wants do not become real instantaneously. Because if it did, you wouldn't like what you I wanted into existence because you're too grotesquely young a being. My word's not his. You know, we're too new at being conscious beings to be able to uh, have our wishes become real instantaneously and like the outcome. So the universe is so arranged. This is more what uh, he was saying. The universe is so arranged such that if you consistently reinforce your strong I want over time, that's how you manifest. Mm. And it still doesn't manifest me being able to kick the winning goal with my left foot. There's limits, but the universe has no choice but to con comply with your request sure, if, you imbue it, if you imbue it with emotionality over to consistently over time. And what I've also learned, my, my addendum is, and it might not look anything like your original picture of what mm -hmm. that's supposed to look like. Yes. The universe is bigger 
than your original picture. My original pictures of what I wanted did not include having uh, written textbooks in the world of palmistry uh, for teachers of my system, et cetera. That wasn't my picture. You know, my I won't got transferred into that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I get a lot of that. It's like, well, uh, it's like you you came to write a song and then by the, the mechanics of the piano, the piano is informing you that you're writing now a different song. And right. I get that all the time. Uh, and so, you know, you're going into the point that I'm trying to coach people all the time, which is how do you break through into the life that you want? And Tony Robbins would say, if your why doesn't make you cry, it's not your why. You need to have an emotional uh, breakthrough. And, and so, I, you know, as a hand analyst, uh, as we are, we are uh, constantly looking at how that client can break through. And particularly in the area of wanting and desire and willpower, we target the index finger for that. The, the Jupiter power, I want, the heart line goes, rises up even toward the index finger and says, I want. And if it's on the right hand, it's I will. And if it's on the left hand, I want. And it tends to be a more desire-based system. If you're Richard Branson, you have a circle there, then you say, I will do, I have a vision and my desire, uh, my directing finger, my index finger, it, and my soul is saying, I can direct this energy. And if it's on the left, then you're like Neil Strauss from Rolling Stone saying, I desire, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do whatever I want. I want freedom. And then the problem is, is what the heck that for people like me that can't seem to consistently keep an I want. That's real tricky who have a tented okay. arch on the right index finger and their left index finger. And it says, it's, I'm never enough to do what I want. And I don't have the emotional stamina to, to keep it up. Okay, so let's say that you're correctly identifying your stumbling point. Right. Okay. I certainly have. So maybe you said that your stumbling point is the poor lighting in your office. That would be an incorrect, um, uh, what's that? An incorrect assessment of what's really going on. Okay. But let's assume because your lighting is fine. Thanks. You, you are on that, <laughs> and it shows. <laughs> but, but let's assume for a second that you've come to the right conclusion as to what um, uh, what is lacking that if it weren't lacking you'd have a different outcome mm -hmm. right right so in my understanding then you need to go to the cosmic gymnasium and do rehab exercises on the particular muscle group that is not working properly mm. okay so have you visited any physical therapists in your ear in, in your youthful uh, lifetime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my my knees went out with Angamarga yoga, and I ended up having to figure out how to get this knot out of my so I could walk again. Right, and I'll be after this call. I'll be going to hydrotherapy right. again, and uh, if I'm fortunate enough, I'll get to do some laps and uh, you know do a half a mile in the pool. So I can't do the other things, but I'm you know I'm still doing this. But I have a physical therapist there, and in at various times through the last decade, she has done her evaluation and pinpointed muscle group X is not sufficiently developed to allow you to do X, Y, Z, or, you know, the back problem that you're saying is a function of muscle group X uh, not doing its share and then your body overcompensated. So she's doing the evaluation. So then fittingly, she says, here are some exercises you can do in the pool that will help you develop that muscle group. Now, she can't do the exercises for me, can she? No. She, no, she can do the exercises while I watch, but that's not really going to yeah, do much. Knowledge is not going to do it either, right? She can tell you and you can learn about it, but you and then you still have to do the exercises, right? Right. And if I do the exercises, does that mean I can then play the violin? No, these are not play the violin <laughs> exercises. These are core over here back over there neo you know stuff like that exercises right. okay so my equivalent to that is rescue kits mm -hmm. and rescue kits are uh, my term for coping mechanisms for life's issues 
So the hand is really a brilliant tool for identifying exactly what the problem is. If the problem were lighting in Brent's office, the hand would say so. The hand says, no, uh, the issue is elsewhere. Here is the issue. So what I ask people to do, if they're willing to do it, and by the way, I'll be willing to do some work with you on the uh, tinted arch issue that you were just describing. So uh, what I ask people to do, first of all, is to track how that muscle group has worked well in your past and worked poorly. Mm -hmm. Look at prior events. There are probably examples of when you were able to do what you're having trouble doing nowadays. Mm -hmm. You know, it might have been when you were five years old in kindergarten. It might have been last Thursday on some unimportant item. But there's probably already a neuron infrastructure on how you can do what you're having trouble doing. I say probably because I don't know. Until I look at your report on prior events and, you know, a current diary of events that I can look at through a different lens than you can as my patient, um, there's probably already in a neuron lattice work that I can tap into. It doesn't have to be uh, created from scratch. But once it's been identified, what you do poorly, what you do well, and now there is a, a clear definition of which muscle group needs to be improved. We can also take a look at what you have done, what, you, what your coping mechanism has been when things go awry in this regard. And what I find is that most people's coping mechanisms have barely been upgraded from childhood. They were put in place by a five-year-old mm -hmm. or three-year-old. At five, maybe throwing a tantrum and sitting on the floor and refusing to eat dinner was your best coping mechanism for a demanding parent. However, if you repeat that when your wife, in your case, makes a request that you don't like, right. Not That's unlikely to work for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know my wife. It, it, well, it might work, but it probably won't work. <laughs> so I call that an outdated coping mechanism or a, an outdated rescue kit. So what I do with clients uh, who, who want to do, who want to work on this is to identify the coping mechanisms deployed. And from a neutral observation post, nobody's here to blame anybody about this. After all, the five-year-old Brent was doing the best he could. That was a great mechanism for dealing with parents like yours. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not critiquing it. I'm just saying that if it hasn't been updated, let's see how it's working in current circumstances. And if it's not, you and me as two adults who are not in the trance of your life lesson and looking at reality through a skewed mirror two adults can put together a coping mechanism update attempt and see how well it will work or not work. And imagine if you were Steph Curry, who just won the basketball championship, uh, a shout out to my favorite basketball player, um, and you're practicing taking a certain shot your coach gives you negative feedback. That's not working your elbows in the wrong position. Who knows what, you know, what little thing he might've been doing wrong. The, the best players are eager for feedback, including feedback of what they can improve upon. And they don't take it as a sign that they're a bad player and I hate you. Uh, I care enough to have looked over your game carefully to find the flaw that you can work on. They want to work on it. So with this attitude, we can look at prior coping mechanisms, see how well they work, make use of what's there that works. Use that as a scaffolding to add to until by using a new coping mechanism rescue kit and applying it repeatedly and tracking its usage, tracking its usage over mm. time. This is what Steph Curry does on the new elbow position with his shot. They videotape the next game to see if he actually integrated the new skill. And if he did in the first quarter, but not the fourth quarter, or he did when he shot moving left, but not when shooting right, then he could practice whatever was missing from the skill until he was able to develop that skill sufficiently, or he couldn't live up to it. He probably could. Anyway, this is just my metaphor uh, or analogy for helping people work on whatever it is that their issue is. The hand diagnosis very well. It's a beautiful diagnostic tool, what the issue is at stake, the obvious issue and what's underneath it. 
And those who really want to change things, they'd be willing to do the soul tracking exercises to see what you already do in regards to this issue, what works and what doesn't work back in old time and in now time. And then practice using a new set of skills, a new, sket, a new set of uh, uh, address the issue attempts until if, if you know behavior A doesn't work, then you work on behavior B. My pool uh, uh, phys ed teacher uh, gives me exercises. And if that one doesn't help me do whatever better, she goes, okay, that exercise didn't work. Uh, let's try this. That was too hard for you. You couldn't do that one well enough to make it work. Here, mm -hmm. let's, let's scale back and try something simpler. You know, that's why I've worked with her for a decade like this. And I'm hoping that I'm describing cleanly enough that it's followable what I'm saying. Um, you know, you do soul tracking exercises, uh, you develop your rescue kits, and then ultimately, Brent, you go to the eight column exercise. Have you and I eight columned? Mm -hmm. I can't, it's been a while, but I basically the eight column exercise, uh, you have to refresh the, why, what were the eight columns that that was. Well, you set up an I want, yeah, and then um, the I want has to be big enough to trigger your life lesson. You yeah. know, you set up something difficult enough for you, something you really want to do, but that you've bumped into things that seem to stop you from getting there. And it's not logistical problems underneath it is whatever your life lesson stuff is that's hard to deal with. And so as we track your progress towards your goal and you bump into your life lesson, you've already rewritten, you pre-written, my anticipated obstacles will be, and my countermeasures will be. And okay. then we take a look at how well you identify bumping into your obstacles or not, whether there were actually different obstacles than the ones you listed. And if you listed the right obstacles, internally generated ones, and then we take a look and see if you use countermeasures, rescue kits. And what people do is they either misidentify their I want. They never really wanted it. It was just a silly pipe dream. You know, I, and I use the example, I want a yellow airplane. Not really. I mean, what would I do with it? Where would I park it? Um, the gasoline, it's noisy, those little airplanes, you know, blah, 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 blah. It's just a pipe dream. You know, like being able to speak Swiss German fluently I think I'm never getting <laughs> pretty much <laughs> up that one. I've unlearned anything. <laughs> In fact, so I've, I've made this population speak more English just because I'm here. <laughs> there you go. So in any event, in the eight column exercise, uh, you set up an I want, you move towards it, you bump into your, your, your difficulty. And that's exactly where we wanted to get to. We wanted to bump into your difficulty, which I'm suggesting is going to be the trance you go into around your life lesson, the way in which you lose track of reality because you're controlled by your life lesson. And then instead of giving up and running away, you engage. The whole point was to get to the point where your life lesson takes over and you give up and you come up with a story about how it's Bob's fault, not yours. Yeah, so you consciously engage, right? So that's the- you Engage with your life lesson. Yeah, that's the eight column exercise is designed to make you bump into your life lesson. And having anticipated it, you had locked the door ahead of time. So you weren't going to run away, you were going to interview your life lesson, when he or she showed up and took over the keys to your car. Yeah, so this is this is I get the theory on this, where the where the practice having coached um, people through this process of the shift is they go in, they give me the whole reason why they have been abused, and that they have no uh, idea how to break through in their life. And they don't know right. what they want. And so I say, okay, great. Let's get a vision board. They got a vision board. That's your, uh, that that's clearly what they want. And then in the process of doing that, all of their not enough money and, and, uh, power and, uh, feeling that they can go through and break through shows up. And then right. the rescue kit that I would offer there is, I don't know, try to exercise more and get more, um, just do it anyway. I mean, they just like, I'm not in the mood to pay my taxes now. I, I'm, guess, I'm guessing, I don't know, because I haven't sat with you on your shoulder as you went through that entire process with individual A or B or C. 
But I can tell you in my experience, because I've gone through the eight column exercise with well over 100 people. Yeah. And the majority do not complete the exercise. And at some point, I'm pulling the rope more than they are. Mm hmm. Yeah, and yeah, <laughs> for sure. As a coach, I'm doing it all the time. I'm really going, you know, where, where did you go? Well, I'm getting around to talking to, I'm getting around, I'm getting around. And so they give the problem the time, get, making sure that they're going to feel better about and have the resources in them to get over right. their internal resistance. So I could tell you what the standard model of failure is with the exercise. So I don't know about person X, Y, or Z. And I don't know if you had been perfecter, hard to imagine, but if you had been a perfecter Brent, whether or not they would have broken through. Okay. Mm. But the, uh, I'm anticipating this problem the entire way through mm -hmm. and I'm attempting to address it before we get to the problem itself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so the problem is the problem is when their life lesson shows up, when they bump up against it, they start to go into their blame, their rage, their, you know, all the stuff that deflects away from it. What I'm trying to do every step of the way with, you know, marginal success, I, you know, I'm really frustrated. I think that this should work 100% of the time. Uh, you can do this. Even Brent can do this. If Brent can do this, anybody, blah, 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 blah. Uh, what I'm anticipating, though, is that uh, when they bump into their life lesson and their life lesson takes over, they can't stop themselves or they seemingly can't stop themselves from going into negative self-talk story. And from inside their negative self-talk story, they beat up their children. They rob the bank. They shoot up a school. They, you know, they, they have unconscious behaviors that don't make them feel better, but make other people miserable like they are. So I'm anticipating that moment as much as possible. And I'm trying to step-by-step step, before they reach that moment, talk about their ability not to handle the circumstance, but they do have a measure of control about the story they tell themselves about what something means. And I'm trying to practice with them on stuff that doesn't really matter. What did you make this mean about you when the waiter didn't listen to your order and listen to Mary instead of you, even though you were trying to get the waiter's attention. What do you think it meant when that guy cut you off in trap? What did you, let's stop it. Let's stop your movie right now and see what you made up, what story you made up about what that incident meant about who you are and your value or anything about yourself. I'm trying to anticipate that fall off point that you identified perfectly. And I'm trying to use every technique possible to pep talk them to pre arrive there. And I'm pointing out that this is, uh, uh, you know, in the Enneagram, I'm an eight. So I believe in heroic acts of great deeds. And I love stories where the guy is outnumbered by a million to one, and he still is able to save the world, you know, uh, Luke Skywalker, blah, 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 all the heroic stories from, from mythology, ancient and new. So those stories appeal to me, and I use that technique because I'm me, and it works for me. I try to do that with my clients and point out that this is the most heroic thing that's possible for you to do in life right now, is tell me the story you're creating. Can you catch you in the act of creating your story right now? And I'm doing that with what happened at the grocery. I'm taking the most main, mundane, unimportant stuff and having them practice with me about making up, I'm making up my story right now. I'm catching me making up my story. I'm not even telling them not to make up their story. I'm not saying that you did a bad job of making up your story. I'm pre-practicing because when I get to that moment, when they make up a story, I'm bad, I'm no good, I'm never going to be any good, never mind, I'm not going to face my life lesson. See, to me, it takes a form of facing tomatoes. You know how I talk about tomato fear, fear of rejection and ridicule. You have to be able to look at your bad news self in the truth mirror and have the bravery to look into that desperate, acne-faced, 
awkward teenager, weak kindergarten kid, whatever. You have to be able to reach out to him or her and bring him in and embrace him and all his insecurities and fears, which, by the way, are very human and you know are kind of universal. Uh, maybe they're not 100% universal, but they seem to be universal. And can you look that you in the eye without running away and making up a story about how the whole world is wrong and it's all because of me? So I'm trying to preset the arrival moment with a history of pre-arrival moment successes and pep talks so that when they get there and I I'm, look at how you're winning by arriving here. You're winning, you win by grapple. You know how I say this, the, the victory is in the grapple. You don't defeat your life lesson. You just stay present with it. You learn from it. You learn from it by not inverting life into some stupid story that you're making up that is not real. You stay real with your life lesson and it shifts of its own accord, not the way you want and not instantly, but you stay real. I'm attempting to preempt that moment each of the coaching sessions prior to arriving there. And by the way, I do this with only limited success. You know, uh, I, I regret uh, the number of times I arrive there and then the person makes up a story about how I'm a bad coach, uh, how the Republicans this, the Democrats that, how George Bush this, how Donald Trump that, how Obama this, uh, how global warming. You know, there's a million ways the dog ate my homework there's a million ways to make up a story that doesn't include it's your life lesson, silly. Yeah, I got it. So it's the story that is um, it's it's causing you to stand on the slippery slippery bar of soap, right? Every time you <laughs> situation. Is that redundant? Is there a non-slippery bar of soap? <laughs> <laughs> a wet slippery bar as opposed to the one that's sticking to it. Yeah, there we go. And so it's a story in itself that is causing people to block. It, it's their fear of looking in the eyes of their desperate self that's hard to look at and being able to be brave enough to, well, it, it's like being a parent and your, your child just stole candy from the other kid or something. And you've got to deal with them and deal with their, their fears about themselves and they're no good, they're terrible, whatever. And you have to be there as the adult in the room, be supportive, but not, you know, make up a story that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll have to return Bobby's bicycle. Yeah, that's true. And what are you going to do to fix the scratch? Yeah, this is a learning moment. I'm with you all the way. But can you do that with you? That takes a certain type of what I'm calling tomato bravery, mm -hmm. um, not rejecting yourself. Can you make up a story where you're just a human being? And even if you did something you didn't like, so you did something you didn't like. That's right. Uh, welcome to the human race. Okay. <sighs> that takes a certain type of bravery. And it's that bravery to not run from that moment. You win by not running from that moment. No matter what you do, do, do something terrible, do something bad, don't do it well. But you didn't run from that moment, you grappled. You win by grappling and your life purpose has no choice but to take its next highest form in your life. Your life starts to look like the picture that's in your fingerprints. All you have to do, that's one little thing, all you have to do is not run away and go unconscious and make up a story that has nothing to do with reality. Mm -hmm. So knowing that that's where I lose my clients, I'm trying to pre, I'm trying to anticipate that moment and to prep them for that moment as best I can for when they get there, that they won't run away. And yeah, again, with limited success, I, you know, I really wish my percentage was higher. Damn. And with myself as well. Uh, you know, I, I see it is so much and I do the visualization and, um, and then I'm in it and I'm like, you know, I need to sell. I need to go and reach out to clients. It's my least favorite thing to do to solve problems and do it. I just want to read hands. I just want to do that all day. But there's a f functional part of this business that requires outreach and finding out where they are and tracking them and I haven't heard from you a while and then going into their problem and you know ah and then is this would this be a, a right product for you at this point and I really have to carry myself into that conversation Correct. Uh, through that and uh it's uh it's enduring and it's cost me a lot of money because of the, sure. the avoidance strategy of everything on YouTube being immensely more interesting 
than to face okay, so in financial planning which i spent six years in which is actually a fairly long uh time uh, 95 percent are out within one year and that's after people pay all the money uh to study for the exams pay the licenses that they need uh, you know, you make an investment. It's not like they just hire you. And then if you don't like it, you leave. You've paid money to become that employee, et cetera. Um, so that is called call reluctance. What you just described has a name. Oh, it's it's called call reluctance. Okay. Yeah. There are libraries written about call reluctance. Right. And so it's anticipated in advance that every new employee will exhibit the full range of call reluctance. So, uh, so I work with my boss, Steve, who became my basketball buddy, as I said before, my poker playing buddy. And um, I, I was reluctant to tell the people in Texas that I was a hand reader. Already, I had a New York accent, which is like cause for execution in Texas in the 70s, uh, blah, blah, blah. But now I'm a hand reader too, uh, even worse. You can hear the jet plane going overhead to help me make my escape. In any event, I eventually told him I was a hand reader and I played around with him and showed him a bunch of, you know, I did a bunch of hands until he went, holy cow, you can actually read hands. This stuff works. So, you know, I read for him. I read for another pal or two. And after that, he had me read the hands of every new possible employee coming in and every <laughs> ongoing okay. employee. And he had me do this surreptitiously, oh, I just love that word, surreptitiously. In other words, uh, you had to have a, a, a quarterly review with the boss to see how you were doing with your goals, et cetera, like this, and uh, to measure your performance in these various criteria. And uh, in general, Steve would do that either quarterly or monthly, depending upon the ambition of the salesperson. And he would have me watch what they did with their hands during the interview. And sooner or later, people would go like this and I get a view. And then we would compare our notes about what we thought. And I was just his associate. Uh, this is Mr. Unger, my associate. I would go, hi. Right, right. And then the interview would take place and then we would talk afterwards. So and Steve already knew what I saw in the hands anyway. He was really good at what he did. But my point is, I watched dozens of people parade in and, out of, uh, in and out of his office over a period of years, all of whom were making up stories about their call reluctance. You know, I would be making sales calls, except my dog is sick. I would be making sales calls, except I have to fix the attic. Um, you know, we would, you know, after a while, you know, the first five or 10, you know, you could believe their story. But the second 10, the third 10, the fourth 10, the fifth 10, it's the dog ate my homework stories over and over and over again. And we could just give each other a sideways glance, just like we could on the basketball court that I would know he was cutting to the basket and I could get ready to make him the pass. We just give the quickest glance and we go, oh, another dog ate my, there it is. That's the dog ate my story, uh, dog ate my homework story. And this guy is out of the business in three months because you can't be that type of person and succeed as a financial planner. You have to be real. You have to be real when you don't like what's going on. Mm -hmm. You have to interact, you have to listen, and you have to talk like a real person, not like inside the story that you're making up about what's going on, or you're out of the business. You can't, you can't sustain in that business. It's a very interesting communication-oriented business. In any event, what I learned by sitting in on those interviews is how outside of the hands world, how people make up stories that is their replacement for the thing is, I just get nervous about talking to people I don't know. I just, you know, I put that off. I don't like doing it. People who said that often succeeded because we came up with, we, Steve, came up with countermeasures to help the person, just like Steve came up with countermeasures to help me succeed as a financial planner. Okay, what about trying this? How about trying that? Try this and I'll measure your progress towards your goal. If it doesn't work, I'll give you, you know, tell me what didn't work. I'll give you feedback and you can improve it. So call reluctance could be seen as a right Jupiter or right uh, fingerprint lesson because you don't want to confront. Well, yes, but my point is that it's universal. Okay, yeah. because Everybody be had call reluctance, everybody. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, there are libraries of books written from people retiring from sales about how I handled call reluctance, how I taught my salespeople to deal with call reluctance. 
what is the nature of call reluctance? So in that world, it's called call reluctance, but we're in a metaphysical type zone. What's the meaning in life? How can I find more meaning in my life? Well, for so many people, they need to interface with the world, just like you were saying. And for each person, that interface is a different dynamic, but it, it goes back to call reluctance, which comes down to tomato fears. That's asking girls to dance, Brent. <laughs> now, as a handsome, dynamic looking, super handsome guy, you never had any fears about asking girls to dance. <laughs> yeah, I didn't become this way until 51. <laughs> as a dorkier looking fellow, <laughs> I had numerous fears about asking girls to dance. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's asking girls to dance fear. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's totally. And so, you know, it, it reminds me of when I had to go and uh, speak in, for the first time in front of a class going from, you know, speaking with two people to speaking in front of a hundred there. I think it, I, to get good at that, I had to get to speak. I was nervous a week ahead of time. And then I would put in an auditorium pictures of people's faces on every seat so that I could get over that fear. And ultimately, I was able to break through it in a way that I survived it and not panic and just lose myself. And to, right. So you came up with a, to me, a coping mechanism, a rescue kit. Yeah, that was my rescue to visualize it in such a way that I could actually see myself doing it. Right. And so the, the next person, Brent 2O, didn't do that and is now working at the salt mine because he couldn't make a living. Mm -hmm. So and beats up his kids. Yeah, exactly. You know, he gets so frustrated and then build it. So what's interesting in in that and you all I have to return this point all the time is that, you know, the way that the fingerprints protect us, the life lesson, the compressed fingerprints, is they make us unconsciously go into a story and they, they run a script of you know blame. They push it, they push us that way. But yeah. we can stay conscious as we're entering into that zone of fanciful thinking that doesn't match reality we can catch ourselves we do have that's where our greatest power is that's what i'm trying to preempt i'm telling people that that's where they have the power to catch when that's happening even if they handle it terribly if you can catch what's that when that's happening if you can become conscious that you're going unconscious around your life lesson if you can just stay conscious then your life will rearrange itself to match the best case scenario in your fingerprints. So is there something general you can tell when you're going unconscious into a story? It's so hard because your meaning making machine is just causing you to daydream and interpret it through a certain filter of emotions. Okay, so if you were working with me over time, I would be able to see it from the outside as you reported what was going on in your life. And if you were brave, courageous, and bold, not just handsome, but brave, courageous, and bold, you'd be practicing that with me so that ultimately you would catch you in that. So I can give you some clues. Before you can use a rescue kit, you have to notice that you need your rescue kit. I guess that goes before without. you can uh, Before you can deploy your coping mechanisms, you have to realize <clears throat> that you're going into your unconscious life lesson. So every rescue kit has to have a list of how you know that you're not in now time dealing with reality. So for me, I have arches. You're lucky, you don't have arches. All you have is these mere little tiny little tented arches, little baby problems of tented arches. If you were braver, if you had more chest hair, if you were more manly, you would have arches, the real king of problems, okay? so. I have arches. So that means sometimes I arch out, right? Which means you go into panic or numbness. One of yeah. the and helpless overwhelm over, over panic and I start doing too much as my way of coping with it. Mm -hmm. Right. So do you think that's reduced to zero? No, it can't reduce to zero. It can move closer to zero, but it never quite gets to zero. I still have arches but I'm much better able at noticing when my arches are starting to take over, are taking over more, or I'm completely in their grip. So I have a wife who knows hands. You've met Alana, yes? Uh, no, unfortunately I've never, never met her. 
because she was she was coming uh, to Zurich for a decade and doing her own classes. Maybe we didn't overlap enough for you to have bumped into. I was just on it. Tail end. Yeah, she's retired from it now. But you know, she knows handwriting as well as you and I do. Um, and um, she would be and still does. She will tell me from the outside that I'm arching out. I will tell her how wrong she is until I catch myself telling Alana that she's wrong about me arching out, which is like a bad argument. It's like a, <laughs> one of those rescue dogs, right? <laughs> That's no good. But also, as I have learned, my fingertips get cold when I'm arching out. Interesting. Yeah. So my body is in a form of shock. My whole body isn't cold. You know, when, you know, there's the car accident and they pull you out of the car before it explodes and then they lay you down on the sidewalk, they give you a pillow and they get a, a, a jacket to put over you because most people's bodies gets really cold and yeah. shock. That's not 100%, by the way, but that's common. So what I'm saying is I have learned that I can have various shock responses where my whole body is reiterating who knows what happened when I was three, five, and eight, and blah, blah, blah. I'm not going to go my whole life story with you, but blah, blah, blah. My shock has been reiterated. You know, a button has been pushed, and my arches are taking over. And I have a physiological response. For me also, I lose um, uh, uh, precise coordination of small movements when my body has its shock response. These are physiological clues that I am arching out. Whether my brain agrees with me or not, I have learned that these are clues that that's what's happening and I need to use my rescue kit. By the way, do you remember seeing The Graduate? Yeah. Movie? Okay, with Dustin, Dustin Hoffman? Yeah. So there's the climactic scene where he's gonna go, what's her name, Elaine? He's gonna go, and then they run off on the bus. But on the way there, he's stopping at a gas station to make a phone call, trying to stop the wedding. And he's fumbling with the cord. He can't get the quarter in the, they had phone booths then. Nobody had phones, it's the 1960s. And he's fun, he can't get the, he can't get the quarter into the slot. Yeah, exactly. Because he's so stressed out, he's losing his fine coordination. <laughs> So I'm losing my, if I'm arched out, I start to lose my fine coordination. Mm -hmm. And it happens with dropping a pen or my handwriting changes. So what I have then is I have a list of physiological clues. I also have a list of thought streams that are clues that I am slipping into the arches taking over. For instance, people on the highway who cut other people off or something like this? Do you ever see such a thing in Zurich? No, not often. No, I don't actually. <laughs> it's a, people it's are more well-behaved. Right. So, uh, by the way, the, there's an increase in bad behavior driving uh, over the last three years. People are just frustrated and they're doing really like mean things to other people just to be mean in the safety of their car. Ha, 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 look what I did to you. Mm. You know, I'm not, it's really annoying. So that starts to happen and I start to have um, revenge fantasies. I'm gonna get my machine gun. I'm gonna follow that car. When, so I'm just using this as a silly example. I have thought streams that appear as I enter arch takeover. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm saying is part of being able to deal with your life lesson is to register that it's taken over. And although that sounds easy as I'm talking to you about it, it's not easy because your arches, my arches, or your life lesson have practiced for decades how to take over without you catching them in the act. Yeah. So part of countervailing that is to be able to have a list that you pay attention to where you know that this has happened through clues that you've proven to yourself are accurate. Mm -hmm. Without that, the rescue kit doesn't work because you won't use it. By the way, have you ever been, uh, what's it called when you don't have any water? Um, dehydrated. Yeah, dehydrated. Have you ever been seriously dehydrated so that your brain was starting to fant fantasy itself? Sure, or I just get so cloudy that I just, you know, not here. That happened to me once. 
I was backpacking. I have 50 pounds on my back. I'm with a guy who's walking ahead of me now because I'm starting to slow down. And I stop. And uh, I'm just laying there, blah, blah, blah. And my backpacking pal comes back to help me. And he goes, what's going on? I can't, I'm not answering well. And he goes, oh, mm. dehydration. I should have thought of it. He gives me some water. I had water. Mm. Pour some water in my mouth. And within a minute, I'm standing up and I'm walking and I'm okay. We get back to the parking lot. We drive away. Uh, we're fine. But it, it's a memory that I have about where my brain was so discombobulated. Yeah. I could have died of thirst with water in my possession. Yeah, I got it. So it really is, you know, your mon that's where the journaling comes, where you're really seeing, okay, yeah, you know, once you understand that you have a right Saturn issue, you go unconscious in the story when it comes to money and accountability and, and worth and stuff. And so therefore you actually have this response and you even Correct. say things and then catch yourself, Correct. you know, continue on with And it. then practice that which is not what you're good at. You practice. And in my experience, the good news about this is it only takes the tiniest little progress on your life lesson to pay off a hundredfold in life purpose points. The mm -hmm. bad news is that the smallest little progress on life lesson can be exceedingly difficult. <clears throat> so I, when you're doing these practicing, so, you know, like I can imagine, I was I originally wrote you because I was curious about this. I've been wondering, I was studying e e um, estrogen, right? Okay. And estrogen has in the, in the womb has influenced the, the um, growth of the index finger and testosterone, the ring finger. One second, I'm, I'm not 100% convinced of that. The, I, I'll call those um, encouraging preliminary findings, but okay, okay, go on. Okay, well, let's say that, let, let's say that hormones do have a, 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 um, uh, a influence in- right. I've, I've, read, I've read the articles and it's right. encouraging. Okay, so, and, and the article suggests that different hormones target different areas of the hands. Correct. Therefore, there are different feelings should, you should be able to feel in different parts of your yang system of the thumb and index finger versus the yin when you're in observing. So in that case, shouldn't you be able to do a mudra or something that would allow you to, to turn on that channel specifically and feel it? Yeah, potentially, yeah. I agree with that. And if you were in touch enough, um, you could think away your arch responses. And sometimes I can. Sometimes I get hand warmers. Sometimes, you know, I've been super stressed out in my life. I know you don't believe this because I've always been the coolest guy ever in every possible oh, scenario. I've never seen you lose your cool. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I can tell you that I have in the privacy of my own home, of course. But nonetheless, so sometimes when I've been stressed out, um, uh, electric blanket, hand warmers, blankets up to the ceiling. Um, uh, I've been freezingly cold. It's taken me 45 minutes to bring my body temperature back to normal. And huh, 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 now I can talk to Alana about, you know, what's going on and she can give me feedback and, you know, we can talk, I can talk my way through this, not to the point of perfection, but um, that shock had a thermal element to it. And as long as I was freezing out, I wasn't going to be able to mudra myself to a more positive state of affairs. Mm -hmm. It was too primal. I had to change my temperature back. Too primal, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the fear response is different, I think, for a tenant arch versus an arch versus yeah. a whirl yeah. or a loop. Uh, breaking the exactly. ice being the loop, the too much story of the worlds feeling just too much energy and you obsessive and you can't let go of it. And tenant arches are just anxious anyway. And tenant arches have a, a, a different flavor and you've been studying them personally for your whole life or if not multiple lifetimes, who knows? But nonetheless, um, there's a similarity between the two. Uh, the arches and the tented arches, in that they're both loop avoidant, which is feelings avoidant. Mm. Mm hmm. That's funny that you see that. That's absolutely, I mean, obviously, right? I mean, they're not. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> they're feeling avoidant, but they use, they're, they're differently, they're different tactically. 
about their loop avoidance. Yeah. Yeah, tactically, um, I guess tenant arch is just like over it, analyze, and uh, the um, the the arches just spin out of busyness. I guess. Well, they, yeah, they they kinesthetically avoid feeling by giving themselves emergencies to handle that require superhuman attention. Mm hmm. And that oversimplifies the story, but yeah. And tinted archers try to think their way around their feelings. Yeah. Again, now, that's a gross oversimplification, but yeah. And, and, and loops, I, I find, are just uh, breaking the ice, like at a party. You know, it's like when you go in and the heart energy, which I believe is the, the duration of the, or of the heart uh, line, if you can break through that party, then your heart is heart space, your heart resonance is out 50 feet throughout the whole party. Yeah. And until then, you can't break the ice. It's an exposure feeling. And for right. and for worlds, I think that they're just, uh, you know, I being I'm married to one. And and what I see is her fear is I just disappointment when is the biggest fear, disappointment. I haven't done enough. And it seems like it's constantly a driving energy of obsession and in her case. Yeah, there were different play. There were different ways to play out the world story, but back to where I was talking to you uh, an hour ago or whatever. My early metaphysical teacher, William David, who thought that the uh, the sun and the planets were just one piece of a larger uh, galactic uh, conglomeration of different stars with different planets and different things are being worked on by different beings. Blah blah blah. His emphasis, though, and the way he he went to said it this way, but his premise was. Can emotional beings, that's earthlings on the blue planet, can emotional beings find in God? On the other planet, they, they're not saddled with that. They're not saddled with what? Vied with God? <laughs> they're not, they don't have mammalian feeling systems. Right. They, they, you know, it's different on these other planets, he said. You know, the, it's not like their feelings avoidant, it's just that that's an irrelevancy you know that that's not what those planets are about right. you know there's a whole different system with different things going on so it doesn't matter whether that's true or not his point was can emotional beings uh find nirvana can emotional beings be happy can emotional beings grow in self-awareness you know it's one thing to grow in self-awareness as a theory but can you know, uh, you know Ram Dass, who just died a few years ago. Oh, I didn't uh, know he just died a few years. Oh, that's okay. So, uh, as he said, you think you're so uh, advanced now. You think you're so conscious. You think you're so smarty pants. Whatever he said, go spend a week with your parents <laughs> exactly. and tell me that's how a, advanced that's you are. Great work. Become a parent. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, <laughs> um, we're emotional beings complete with all our childhood emotional XYZ stuff that's still filtering around through our bloodstream, even though none of our blood platelets are the same from back then. But nonetheless, there it is. And, you know, it's tricky to find God, however you would, you know, rephrase it the way you like, as an emotional mammal being. <laughs> so you've that's got the tricky about earthlings. Yeah, you have a new, I want to make sure that people who are might be listening to this understand you have a new book out that is, uh, and I want to share this uh, book to those who might be watching this, because just check out the number of pages of this m mammoth. Yeah, so this is volume one. Yeah, I'll stop sharing. So you get, you, yeah, so you've got uh really nice yeah this is volume one okay and the vol uh there's three volumes each about 500 pages because uh i want this to be as you can see here a university level training program this is a go to college and not some place where you pay a bunch of money and get a degree without and you get your uncle to take the exams for you college yeah no you actually attend classes 
argue with your professor, get kicked out of class for flirting with Sally when the, during the, you weren't cheating, you were flirting with whatever. You know, this is attending a university and this is your freshman year. And if you survive, now you get to be a sophomore. And that's Hand Analysis 102, which I'm near done writing, by the way. But this is 101. Again, there's you know, three of these books because it's a course. And uh, I loved writing this book because I'm converting the training manuals that you used as you were studying with me. But I converted that into a course. When you're studying in a classroom, you have a dozen other students. Uh, we do handprints in class. There are conversations. You work in small groups. You have a supervisor to work specifically with you, blah, blah, blah. And not everything has to be written down in the training manual because it gets covered in classroom discussions, plus your personal supervision, just you and your supervisor who is helping you deal with your version of what's important to you in the class. How can I convert the original training manual into that course that you took such that a person could take that course without being present with me since I'm not gonna be on the planet forever? Mm. We would love to, that you are, but this is you being on the planet forever, actually. With this, this, and yeah, if I can't play basketball, I don't know what the value <laughs> is of staying here. But nonetheless, you see the point. <laughs> Thank you for mentioning that. So um, the, the, um, the hard copies, the, it's available electronically right now. The hard copies um, have arrived in North America. I don't have my hands on them yet, but they've been shipped. They've arrived in North America. They have to be transferred to what, the, the place where it gets mailed out if you buy on Amazon and stuff like that. And then I'm going to pick up 50 copies uh, to keep here and to mail it out personally when people write me an email uh, because they want a copy. So and this thank is a you great deal because this was a several thousand dollar course of, you know, I ended up pay, paying, I guess, 3,000. Uh, no, it's $8,000 eight times. If you take eight, every three, all three years, it's 8,000 times three. Yeah. And uh, it, so easily I've, I've spent 24,000 just to get to a, a, a man. And think of all the perspiration that you've gone through. <laughs> easily so and this is 1400 pages so you would say this is the equivalent of level uh one and year long two. no this is equivalent of the year long level one only level you one went, yeah. you, you went further than that uh, so this is so you're saying that you're going to develop this is when this uh, an electronic form is 1400 pages you're going to you're going to develop a second and third version of oh, this i'm 85 percent done writing Hand Analysis 102. Um, in, there's a thousand pages of text and 500 pages of workbook. And um, in, the text is done. Um, there's some editing. I have different editors, one for little picky Saturn things, one for a concept, you know, I have different editors who are working with me. Uh, so there'll be some, you know, erasures and refinements, et cetera. But nonetheless, I'm, more than halfway done with the uh, workbook. So I'm about 80, 85% done with 102. It'll be done before the end of this year, easy. Well, one of your, your chief uh, markets will be people who have actually gone through your courses and they love, I, I personally love uh, everything that you have written because you're always giving an angle that is so freaking hard to get your head around. And then you're just seeing it from another angle. And this one is really good because it shows how you make combinations. Now I was writing in my book, my scribbly notes all the time as you go turn to 1425 and, and, and I was always trying to make those combinations, but here you're writing them out. And that is one of the, the main you know, benefits I see out of this is following your thinking of how you weight the system and what is the key thing that you see. Also one of the key takeaways is that Often a person, when they're speaking about a desire they have, they have a, a simultaneous dilemma of a competing desire that comes out at the same time. And you address that in spades in this. Uh, and I think you, you never really fully uh, went into that topic with us on, um, in our class, but it's really magnificent how you were able to show through that level of thinking, you kept that going for, for several chapters on how those uh, dilemmas 
present themselves. And if you can solve those dilemmas for a client or they can somehow resolve that in a way, they've got their life. Yes. So uh, have you ever taken uh, learning a foreign language as an adult? Didn't you take classes for learning German? Yeah. Right. Or wasn't there a textbook? Yeah. Yeah. Did you have to do homework exercises? Uh-huh. Right. Is there anything like that in palmistry world ever? No, that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. So how are you supposed to learn a skill? There's no training manual. There is no training manual that has ever been created by anybody that follows like what a training manual looks like. Mm -hmm. That's a, this is that, this is what I want to leave behind a training manual so that my field is not hampered by the non-existence of a training manual. That's A. And by the way, it's for people who are willing to apply themselves. It's not a junior high school training manual. Mm -hmm. It is a university level training manual. Uh, the homework exercises, you have to apply yourself. Don't apply yourself if you don't want to, but you're not learning this stuff if you don't apply yourself. Duh, it's, it's not set up that way. That's A. B, there's an emphasis on combining, just like you say, and advanced combining, which is triangulating, which is taking three things. Here's the formula, here's the diagram, fill in the blanks yourself. Here's the answer, see how you did like that. And this is why it's important. But two other factors. One is how do you talk to people now that you've figured this out from the hand, how do you talk to a person whose mercury finger is short? Mm. How do you talk to a person whose Jupiter finger is short? If you tell somebody that they're X, they're not gonna listen to you. So I remember, uh, this is a famous reading for me, famous from New York, 1980 something. That's a long time ago now. And I'm remembering it 40 years later. So I'm reading for this guy and his hand was all yellow. He has critical nails. Do you know what critical nails are? Uh, yeah, they're really kind of like, um, it's like the window was like uh, of that nail is really short. It looks like um, looking in your rearview mirror, the shape is like this. Yep. Right. So the hands are yellow. The nails look like it, the hand is critical. So I tell the guy that he has a high criticism factor. And you know what he does instead of thanking me and saying, oh, this is really accurate. You're a wonderful guy. I love you. Uh, name your favorite charity so I could sign a contribution. <laughs> <laughs> no. He goes into a criticism of my appearance, the way I'm doing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he gets critical. That's right. If I told him he's angry, he would have punched me in the nose. Who knows what he would have. You just can't announce it and expect the readee to listen the way you think that they <clears> might. <throat> so there, every single part of the book, there is how to talk to people about this. And there's not just one thing to do to talk to people about it. It's a whole deal. By the way, a whole bunch of that is how to listen. And by the way, I can't assume that you know how to listen. Steve, my business guru, communications expert, he taught me how to listen. I thought I knew how to listen. I didn't know how to listen. He taught me how to listen, which was invaluable. By the way, have you ever talked to a therapist for a while? Ask them how important listening is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You gotta be able to listen. So that's two. And the third thing is, which is also not in other palmistry books, is this is a field that you have to be working on yourself to get good at. I assume that you could be a good pipe fitter without becoming a better human being. I assume, I don't know. I'm just saying that off the top of my head. But you can't continue to read hands if you're unwilling to contend with your own life lesson as it shows up. Exactly. Well, that's what that's the main reason to do it, in my opinion. That's the main reason to do it. That's the good news and the bad news. And the more hands you read, the better you get at it, the more accurate you are helping people, and the more you see your own self in the same mirror all the time. So for people wanting to teach this and use this as a, as a university level or offer this as a class, um, how do you recommend if I, like say for me, if I'm a teacher and I want to, you know, organize an online class of people, is it your view that I could share this uh, with the, that community uh, and, and then, you know, request that they buy it? Like I could share the, the material online? Sure. sure. And, and, you know, there are other palmistry teachers that have been trained with me or with Alana uh, and uh, including Pascal, who trained with Alana, uh, et cetera. 
Uh, and I'm expecting that they'll use this material because it's an upgrade over what's been used uh, before. Uh, and that's fine. But let's say um, it's 20 years from now and I'm not on the planet anymore. Perhaps I won't be, um, but maybe I will be. But in any event, so somebody buys the book, you still have to go through the course. You can't just glance at the book and then it's yours. Uh, maybe by 20 years from now, there'll be a hat that you wear, you attach it with an electrode and poof, it's in your brain, but I don't think so. But nonetheless, so you get good at this stuff, go right ahead and teach it. But I do recommend that the people who are really serious, who are learning this stuff, who are reading lots of hands and then having experiences. I learned in a vacuum. Can you imagine this, Brent? I didn't have anybody I could talk to about this stuff. You know, I read for years, decades, with nobody to compare notes to, nobody to, you know, I said this to him, would, would you have said that to him? He had this marker in the hand. What do you do with it? I had nobody to talk to whatsoever. You know, I learned in a vacuum. You didn't, you learned in a classroom. That's absolutely invaluable. So I do recommend that if people get serious that they hire an IIHA tutor, you, me, somebody else, get in touch with me and I will give you the names of people who are ahead of you on the palmistry trail. You can talk to about your pattern recognition. Is this really one of these? I mean, I get a regular supply of emails from all sorts of students like you who are fairly well advanced. What would you do with this weird line formation over here? Is this one of these? And I'll write yes, no, maybe. So I'm doing plenty of those anyway. It would be good to have a tutor to help you with your pattern recognition. But also I'm working with my students this way. The ones I'm doing coaching with somebody and in the making of the rescue kits, I ran into this issue. You know, if you're a therapist, how many years of supervision must you go through before you're fully licensed? Uh, usually, uh, yeah, five, four or five years, right? Yeah, my brother did that. He said, I paid this guy enough for him to buy a new house. And it was part of the law. I had to do that before I got my full license, et cetera. Yeah. So like any other field, it pays to get uh, help from those. They're not necessarily better, but they've been on the trail longer than you have. And yeah. therefore they're ahead of where you're at so far. So uh, in, in that event, um, you know, I would encourage people that are listening to this, that they, they buy the book. And then we have a teacher uh, or we organize a class or online session where you could go in and um, book uh, and you could we could go through this. So how long do you expect that this would take to uh, go depends on how long it depends on how long uh, you're going to get good at it and how good you're going to get. My anticipation is that this book is a year long read, read again, read hands, refer back to the book. Um, it's, let's say you were a speed reader with 100% retention. Let's just say for the sake of argument. And let's say you've read all 1400 plus pages, memorized it perfectly and can repeat them uh, to 100% accuracy, okay? You still don't know how to read hands. You have to talk to live people. You have to hear Mary cry when you say this. 100. You have, yeah, you have to hear Bob tell you what a jerk you are for trying to convince him you know, you have to deal with live people. You have to be interactive. Plus, when you hear somebody make excuses for their life being the way it is, and it sounds like your dialogue with yourself, holy cow, then what? Right. Right. So the, the course could be studied and memorized in a matter of months, depending upon your memorization skills, if you have those or not. But I see this as a year-long course. Mm -hmm. by book or just like it was for you when you took your year long that took a year hence the title by the way i've also suggested in the book multiple times that somebody reading this book get yourself five friends to read the book with you do the class together as a group be a peer group with each other <laughs> you know struggle together five of you six of you struggle trying to figure is that a d fork or isn't it a d fork Maybe it's, is that really a D4? Now you can always call Brent and ask him. He could tell you whether it's a D4 or not, but struggling to figure that out on your own has value in and of itself. Looking back, I'm so glad I had to struggle with all that with nobody to talk to. Although I tell you, it was like walking through a desert by myself. 
it's like being without a cell phone, if you can imagine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're isolated. Well, it's been uh, really wonderful uh, to, to be with you, uh, um, Richard, and I, I will definitely put the link to your book on uh, my uh, website uh, in, in, on the YouTube channel so that people can come and check it out. I have two people that I'm coaching, three, excuse me, three people that I'm coaching. I'm going to recommend that uh, uh, we use this book and we just go through this. And I, I would love to know how the heck you get this into a university so a university will endorse this and then have me teach it online. I would love that. Yeah, wouldn't that be cool? You know, I was working with uh, Barbara Schmidt on that concept uh, before uh, we just gave up on that, but we worked on that for quite a while, and she's very knowledgeable in that regard. And in Switzerland in particular, uh, the requirements are as follows. Here's the several pages worth of the requirements as follows. Um, and she thought that would be a good idea. I was less uh, sanguine about the entire um prospect of doing all that you know in the long run i decided i didn't care about that uh, i'm not here to try to prove anything uh, to people on the other hand i completely support it if you can get through the labyrinth of paperwork uh more power to you if you have the patience uh to talk to person x y and z in the way they need to be spoken to i tip my uh what kind of cap did you that the cap that has the hair on top <laughs> Well, you bet you've taught it in classes before. So somehow you have broken through and. Uh... Well, I, I taught classes forever. I'm still teaching classes. You know, I still have a year long. Yeah, I guess on the university level is what I meant. But still having this as a class. Oh, I, did, I taught I taught as the um, adult education, part of the adult education non-course credit uh, at the State University of New York at Binghamton. I did that for a couple of years, which was a lot of fun. That is so cool. You should have seen the workbooks back then, Brent. They were chiseled in stone. People had to carry these uh, rock yeah. uphill in the snow both ways. It was so hard back then. Well, I, I, I love you, Richard. And um, thank you so much for your time for this. And, and uh, it's just a treasure to be able to apply your wisdom for this for these breakthroughs. And, and I'm sure the biologically, physiologically, there's a whole range of new wisdom just to understand what each one of these areas uh, trigger and and uh, and how to break through and the toolkits for each one of those. So, uh, so I, I'll uh, I'll close the call now. Uh, as well, we have a storm that's just brewing here, so I got uh, and children have just come and invaded my space. So it's time to be a dad instead of a hand reader. Brent, as always, I enjoy talking to you. You're lots of fun. <laughs> All right. I love you. I love you, Richard. And greetings from Switzerland. Brent. All right. Bye-bye.